There's a difference between an occupation and a job, job. title. Mm -hmm. A receptionist and a PA might be doing the same thing, but they carry different titles in organization. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to go into the nuts and bolts of it, but just to say it's a very important instrument but who uses it and for what purpose it is used is very critical. What I did pick up in my research was we tend to take a very complex framework and we push it down on employers to do this type of complex mapping without the necessary support. This, so it's very critical that we build on the OFO. And I think that was work that was not really fully undertaken initially at that point in time. So coming to the question, have we done enough research on the OFO? Have we contextualized it to South Africa? There's always an example I used when I was in the department. It was because this was the international framework that was brought into the country as part of a policy instrument to be contextualized. There was an occupation called sex worker. In some countries, it's accepted as part of the occupational framework. In South Africa, it was not a, it's not a recognized occupation. It's a practice that might exist. So there was a lot of work that needed to happen to bring it into the South African context. And similarly, in my study, I found that the relationship or the interlink between the OFO and occupation to the education, the NQF, and I want to say broadly education because NQF is one part, but actually at a curriculum level, a qualification level, I think the expectations of what the OFO is meant to do mm. versus what it is expected to do at uh, are beyond its framework. There are parts of it that need to be developed for national planning purposes, which are key, because we need to understand occupations in a certain way. And it works in other countries, but they use it for a specific purpose. In our case, we want to use it for data reporting. We want to use it for research. We want to use it for skills planning. We want to use it for uh, NQF mapping, and I think that's where some of it has to be refocused. So I think it's not a silver bullet. Like Prof said, there's no silver bullet. I think OFO has been sold as a silver bullet, but it's not. Then I must just say as a last comment, a colleague of mine always used to say this, and I think when I say it, all of you will know who I'm talking about. <laughs> The OFO and the NQF alignment, there's always a perception that there's a one-to-one -one relationship. If I'm a teacher, I'm going to, if I have a teacher qualification, I'm gonna be a teacher. I know many of us sitting in this room that have qualifications, but we are actually sitting in occupations in other fields. Is that wrong or right? So I think I just want to say that uh, that alignment issue, uh, it's not a silver bullet. And I think I'm not defending the OFO, mm. but I think we need to understand its use and purpose as an instrument. Absolutely. Thanks, uh, thanks Melissa. I think that picked up lots of important issues around the tool as well as the use of the tool. And it's important to separate the two. So lots of the, I mean, not that the tool's perfect, but I also would, uh, would, would, would like to add that uh, if there's anybody that has other questions beyond the OFO yes. in, 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 the, in the next round, but, but I will give the two of you a chance to, yes, I know, respond. I, just a very quick response, and I'm not going to cover the OFO, but I think just to say, you know, what Prof. Lay said earlier, that we've got a number of systems, et cetera, mm. and it might just be about how we relook and review using these same systems. I find in South Africa, oh, the NQF isn't working. What else can we look for? Mm. As opposed to let's work with this thing and let's work with the OFO and take what we need from it. Um, and so I really want us to, to start to, to, to be more constructive about, you know, about helping policymakers like us who are looking for something uh, to take us forward uh, and perhaps not using the ideal tools to do so.
Um, thanks. Um, I think I'll, I'll just go get to the chase. The question asked was, is there any research being done? And yes, the QCTO has done research and is continuing to do research because we don't believe the OFO um, can supplement for a fully fledged qualifications, occupational qualifications framework. Um, so that work is, is going on. Um, unfortunately, with the onset of the um, COVID and um, now with us um, being in this economic climate that we are in, um, looking at the number of learners that need jobs and need jobs, and I'm using the word jobs now, then the OFO becomes that instrument that we would be using. Um, and the QCTO is working um, together with um, BIB, that's the Federation of in Germany, Germany um, on, on developing um, a set of qualifications that will then um, include all of these that the OFO does, but uh, the OFO does it in terms of jobs, and we would want to move them to occupations. So just a quick uh, response to that, and just to say that I'm not a supporter of the OFO at all. Thank you. <laughs> I don't think you're allowed to say that, Vijayan. <laughs> I just, I just, I just said it. I just said it. And, and, we, and we just taped you. <laughs> well, well, well. I'm still trying to find out why Ulum, uh, QCTO. Sorry, I want to say why, why, why did QCTO adopt the OFO as a qualification framework in the first place? Um, and that's where I'm coming from. And no, so absolutely. when I say I'm not a supporter, I mean as there has to be a qualification framework. Yeah, as a basis um, for qualifications development. Yeah. So I'm, I'll stand up and I'll still say that. Even yes. if you're no, I know. I've heard you say it before. Yeah. Okay. I think I will respond to the issue around why are there so many occupations, managerial related occupations, okay. in the uh, in the critical okay. skills list. And I think this is uh, one area that has always uh, attracted uh, attention. And uh, I think in terms of the critical skills list, we're focusing in the main uh, on the occupations that we can't necessarily find um, in the country, and also those that take longer to, 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 to develop. And we, the critical skills list contains both the high-end skills as well as the, in, as well as the intermediate uh, skills in terms of the artisans and so forth and so forth. And with regards to the managerial uh, positions uh, in particular, we had quite a, a number of uh, issues there because um, Home Affairs came to us and said that this occupation is problematic, as you are already highlighting it, because most foreign nationals that come into, into the country always indicate that they are managers. I mean, somebody who runs a spaza shop can also say, I'm a manager. manager. So in terms of, and those are some of the occupations when we're engaging with business, they always highlight that there's quite a shortage in the country. And what we then sorted to do was to begin to highlight in terms of the NQF, uh, as well as the, with the assistant of SAQA, to specify the NQF level in relation to the managerial uh, positions that are in the critical skills list, just to begin to deal with the problem around anybody else coming into the country and saying that they have a uh, they are a manager, they're going to be a manager of a spaza shop, they're going to be a manager for uh, the, the, the common example that they normally use is the, for the driving schools. So everybody was coming through that uh, particular managerial position. So we needed to make sure that we have some sort of a, a tool to assist us in terms of making sure that those that come into the country have the necessary skills in terms of the uh, methodology that we have and the criteria that we have developed. And having said that, I, I would also be responding to the question around the variables that we consider in terms of identifying or defining critical and scale skills. To say that, you know, our methodology have been evolving a lot 
mainly because of some of the issues that have been raised here, the issue of the OFO, the issue about the NQF uh, level, and also just to make sure that we are being transparent in terms of developing this methodology. So in the main, the methodology covers two aspects. It's both qualitative in nature and quantitative. I'm not gonna dwell much into all the indicators that we have there. You can find that in our technical report. But in the main, we wanted to make sure that the technical aspects covers all the data sources that I have mentioned in terms of tracking whether an occupation is uh, in demand in terms of employment over time, in terms of the vacancy rate and so forth, but also what is important was to take the qualitative aspect of it in, in, in making sure that we take all the nuances that we will normally get making use of the data sources, but we can only get that when we're engaging directly with various stakeholders, particularly our business uh, in this in this case but then we have produced a technical report where we're detailing the methodology that we have adopted and we always say when we engage that we 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 want people to begin to critique that methodology and raise whatever issues that they have with us because we know this issue around the identification of skills needs is quite complex, but then we need the assistance of various stakeholders in terms of strengthening the methodology going forward. Thank you. Any last, okay. So I'm gonna take uh, sorry, another round of questions. Oh, sorry, there was just one around the ECD. Yes, yeah. Uh, to and I might be the last person you expect to be answering yes. right? <laughs> that question. <laughs> but but all, I can, all I can say is that from um, our side, um, we have developed an ECD qualification at NQF level four, which the department was keen on or has taken on board uh, for the training of the ECD practitioners. And I know that that's a big issue now because it is moving from uh, one department, I think, social um, to education. So um, part of our processes here was also to develop an RPL toolkit uh, for uh, practitioners who have already been in the, that field um, to fast track them through that. Uh, that we've done some time ago, so exactly where that process is right now, I wouldn't be able to answer. But uh, in terms of the ECD, that's a far as I can give you right now. All right. Thanks, Vijayan. Uh, before we take in the, ne the next round of questions, I would just like to make one uh, a statement around the OFO, is that through MAMPO, the LMIP project, and REAL is doing the study for the LMIP project, is doing a critical review of the OFO. So if you have empirical experience, please write to me and share your experience with the LMIP project. And if you have questions around the OFO, I'm very happy to receive it. And uh, there will eventually be a kind of workshop around the report. But if you're definitely experiencing problems with the, with the OFO and have experiences, you're very welcome to send me an email. OK, I'm going to take another round of questions, not OFO related. Yes. Thank you. Um, when I was registering, uh, it was just my name that was there, Jocelyn. So I thought I was so well known, you know, people would know my surname. I was quite disappointed. So it's Jocelyn Fuss um, at the Department of Trade and Industry. Uh, and for my sins, I'm still a student here at Real. Um, I was looking at the... Um, when, when I think of the history, Department of Higher Education and Labor, and I remember at the time when the shift happened from labor, that skills moved from labor to higher education, it was a big, uh, there was a big uproar around that because of all the controversies that went before that. And at the time, I was uh, writing something on that shift um, that, that the link between uh, skills and the labor market, at least the hope was that it wouldn't be lost. But at the same time, being situated in the Department of Labor, that link itself was also not very visible. So when I listen to the research that has been done and when I listen to colleagues and having been in, in, in the field for quite a while, it's quite clear that that link has actually been strengthened, it may not be of the quality and substance that we want between skills 
and, and understanding the relationship to the labor market, but at least it's been vocalized. We've tried to institutionalize around it. We've got policies, regulation, we've got systems, and so forth and so forth. So I think that's a very good start, and that, that is why partly when I was listening to to uh, Professor Lay, I was actually wondering, she's very negative about this because I actually see many more positive things going on around mm -hmm. this. Um, so, so, so I think there, there is a need, I think, sometimes to look at it in a more balanced way if one tracks the history of, of it. So I want to come then to a second point. So, so now we've, we've, we've gone, we've made that link between skills and the labor market at least a bit more explicitly. But there was a question that Professor Lay raised. She was saying that during the COVID story, uh, employers were saying uh, one of the critical or scarce skills is, uh, what was it, critical thinking. Now, where does one develop critical thinking? It's quite frankly, you do that. If you have a proper education system, you do that in primary school. Basic, you know, because as, as human beings, we are very creative. We can, uh, you know, we, we're interested in discovering new things. And then the education system start teaching you to think in boxes. And so when one looks at the TIMS results, you find that kids that are measured entering grade one, by the time they get to grade three, uh, I, I may be mislaying, you know, those, those grades. The word that I want to use in Afrikaans, it says, imant is doof. So someone is a bit not quite clever. And, and, and the TIMS results actually show that our kids become dover as they go up in the education system. So, so that creativity, that natural capability to think and to play and to explore, we begin to downgrade that. And so when I think about where the economy is going, the cognitive skills, what the employees are saying, we interpreting that bureaucratically, but what they're actually saying to us is that thinking ability, innovative creativity, we don't find that in our workers. Of course, they're not gonna look at what their own role has been uh, in that sort of process of doffing their workers. Uh, but that is what's happening. And so for me, the the, I think one of the, the things that we need to start looking at, whilst we've made that link between skills and the labor market, we have to start looking upstream at what is the relationship between education and skills. Because what we are not looking at, one of the biggest, um, or, 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 or a trend in all of the studies that we've done, is the duplication of NQF levels, whatever that is. So our kids repeat matric in all sorts of ways. They go to academic schools, they do matric. They become an artisan, they do in three and four and five and six. They've, 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 they've repeated matric. Uh, they find NQF level four learnerships. They go and do that with matric. Huh? That's a process of, I don't know, but as far as I understand in Afrikaans, so what I'm saying is that we, we, whilst we are tackling this thing of education and the labor market, we actually need to look at that relationship between education and skills because we cannot have a system that's probably doing remedial work. So if you want to train an artisan in South Africa, these days we've got an oversupply of matriculants, but we redo matric as a technical matric. And that's wastage in the system, it's wastage of creative potential. But our kids have to go through that because that's what the system says. So for me, that's just another area that perhaps we need to begin to look at because we don't have a lot of money. And the fact that we're reinvesting and recycling qualifications all over the show, but we still don't come out with kids that are creative, et cetera, et cetera, is a problem. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Justin. Thanks. Thank you so much, uh, Tolika is my name. I, I want to also ask a question around the critical skills that Mampoku spoke about. Uh, I understand it to be a terrain of the Department of uh, Home Affairs. And uh, I've seen that the, the list has improved. 
has moved from 107 uh, kind of skills that are critical to 146. Uh, interestingly, uh, of the list is that they've removed quite a number of uh, in, the in the first list skills that were said to be critical uh, to, to a more cogent and more coherent uh, uh, skills that you, uh, you can uh, somehow agree that of course, yes, there are elements of not uh, being available. But the question I have, uh, Mam Pog, is that if we say the 146 skills are critical and not available in the economy, do we mean our 26 universities and 50 colleges and the different training that are happening in the workplaces are unable to produce those? Uh, that's one. And if so, where do we then expect to, to get these skills that the economy need? I'm asking this because of the, the 54 countries in the continent, uh, 24 of them have NQFs levels. And of the 24, 14 have up to NQF level 10. And majority of them, they don't have. So where do you expect to get these so-called critical skills uh, 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 outside the country? But lastly, and very interesting, I want the House to think about this, whether does it really make sense? Yeah, I'll make, ask a question about why management is regarded as an, as an occupation. So if you read the list, it says we need a director. It then explains the role of a director and then tells you about the qualifications. But it's not specific. It says honors degree, a postgraduate diploma, but it does not specify which area in which the economy needs these skills. It's just generic diploma or honors degree. It doesn't specify whether in international relations, but it says a director, it's a skills that the economy needs, but in what is not specific. And also, also talk about the call center manager, which uh, is critical in the economy. Uh, our universities, I would assume, does not have capacity to produce those. Yet the, the presentation by Ruth in the morning uh, said that the, what is this industry? that call center, the call center industry is growing uh, and it does not need a formal uh, skills or formal qualifications. Yet the least uh, regard a person working in the industry as, as critical that the economy needs. So I wanted to understand, how, what is your understanding of the skills uh, uh, needs in these different sectors? Because some of these skills really for me where I'm seated, they really don't make sense. For instance, it says we need a university lecturer. What does it take to be a university lecturer? Does that, that can form part of the critical skills list? Thanks. Okay. Hi, my name's Ken Duncan. I work for an international TVET consultancy called Skillsonics. And I want to just raise the, the, the question of labor market information again. Um, you know, all information begins you know, with data. And the DHET collects tons of data, always has. Um, Ms. Kaluve, I want to say your unit has done excellent work in turning that data into information by relating it to some sort of a context. Um, and in the last uh, few years, I've made use of some of your publications, such as the analysis of enrollment and throughput in TVET colleges, um, in the DHET's funding and expenditure trends. You know, this really helps to turn raw data into information which is not so specific that it can't be applied to a number of fields, but it kind of cuts out a lot of, uh, you know, cloud of, uh, of, of stuff that we don't necessarily need. Now, related to that, I mean, as I say, your unit's done extremely good work, but there is a, an area where labor market information is absolutely critical and it's not there, and that's in the CETAs. So I want to ask you, or, or Melissa, with your background, you, you might be able to, to comment as well. Is there any kind of initiative um, or strategy or you know, endeavor going on to get the CETAs to perform their critical function of providing labor market information, which then is you know, the basis of all decisions thereafter? Because their data collection at the moment is terrible, by and large, and their analysis is almost non-existent. So that's a question I'd like to hear from you about. 
I can try to do this thing. I didn't but uh, there may be a senior person in the audience that would like to comment on that question as well, since none of them actually, and there are a couple of senior people that are in the audience involved in it. So we're very happy to hear from any of you as well in terms of your experience, Nicola. Hi, yes, thanks. My question goes to, oh, sorry, hi, I'm Nicola Jenkin, I'm at Fitzreal, and I've done a lot of supply and demand pieces of work. And what really interests me is, is futures thinking, transitioning those skills for the future. Um, aside from, you know, the informal jobs and things, kind of the futures. So it's a general question is around when you are doing your work, and you are identifying job skills, and I'm a huge fan of what Steph said earlier, knowledge. Um, how do you consider future trends and transitioning? And we're doing a lot of work in the energy sector at the moment. We could say a critical skill right now is manganese miners. But maybe in 30 years time, those mines are not going to exist. Mm -hmm. And we know that's a fact. So my question linked to that is in what you do, how does one ensure that the dominant voice um, or the loudest voice doesn't necessarily become the curriculum? <laughs> no. and, and yeah, is there a critique mechanism? And I know you said it's str you struggle, you can get everyone in the room, and then the critiquer um, is, you know, identified afterwards. So I'm just intrigued to know that, because it is difficult. Thank you. Thank you Nick. Okay, thank Prisha. I'm Scholastic uh, Mazibu, I'm a real master student, working at Tumalusi and uh, Evolution and Accreditation Units for TVET colleges. My question is based on the phasing out of the N1, N1 to N3 program, engineering studies, to say how is it going to make things maybe different or improve the unemployment uh, situation, particularly in our youth in this country. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> Okay, I, I think I will take the question around why do we have call centers, uh, managers? We don't have a, an occupation called management. And I think that in terms of the critical skills list, we do provide specification in terms of the managerial positions that are there. And also, I think it was a question around university lecturers. I will start with that because this was also an occupation where there was a whole lot of contestation. Actually, we received even a query from the parliamentarians to say, why are we having university lecturers in the critical skills list when we can actually get our unemployed uh, graduates with uh, a BCom in education or a BCom in economics if we have economics, economists as being in shortage? And we had to actually engage with Youssef on this matter. And the response we have received here is that having a qualification doesn't necessarily mean that you have all the pedagogy needed to actually be a lecturer. And then what we have done that, what we have done there, and in terms of the list that we have published, we have actually detailed the number of uh, areas where there is a shortage. So in the list itself, you will see that there's lecturers in shortage, but there is a note there to specify in which areas. So it's not just any specific lecturer, but there are specificities that we have provided to guide the areas that are in, in, in shortage. And again, with regards to the call center, an area of contestation that took us longer actually in the, uh, uh, when we were engaging with NetLeg. The, 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 the motivation that was provided here was that we need the call centers that can be able to speak various languages. And when, we, I mean, for South Africans, we, when we see call centers, we're thinking that anybody with a metric can actually be, can actually be able to do this type of job. But what business indicated and that they want, and supported even by the methodology that we have used, was the fact that there is 
and a language that needs to be taken into account when we're looking at the call centers that are in shortage, particularly during the period of COVID-19, because we were working from home, business was business transaction had to be done virtually and so forth and so forth, meaning that even in the uh, call center space, there's engagements with various clients sitting in various countries and so forth. And the other question that was asked was, are we saying that we can't find people with, the, with the, our universities? Our universities can't be able to produce this uh, 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 people with the relevant qualifications aligned to these occupations. So the, the critical skills list is a short-term mechanism. So it's addressing what Prof was actually saying in her presentation to say that the identification of skills needs for the short term. So it considers those occupations that are needed for projects that are happening now in the country and we can't find people with the right skills. And I think I've mentioned when I was responding to your question around our managers to say that to develop people, to develop just somebody with a BCom degree, it will take three years or something like that. But these skills are needed now. That is why we're looking outside of, of the country for those people with the experience and the, and the qualification to be able to ensure that strategic uh, projects are implemented now while the system is preparing those occupations. So while we're saying we're utilizing the critical skills list to get people from outside of the uh, from foreign nationals to, 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 to come into the country, the education and training system, on the other hand, is putting processes in place in terms of developing the qualifications, the programs, and so forth, to ensure that in future we have people with the relevant skills that are needed. And again, the other question that was asked was with regards to the future thinking or the skills for, for, for the future. I think that is a very important point that you're raising. And I remember at some point we attempted to develop a, a, a projection model to develop uh, 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 skills in partnership with real. And <laughs> I think Steph will come in and respond <laughs> on this issue. But there were issues around the sustainability and affordability of that methodology. But currently, through the LMIP project, we are looking into developing a, 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 a projection model to, to, to assist us with that. Um, yes. I think we've covered all. Okay, I think I'll, I'll cover the, the two. Um, yeah, um, in terms of um, the, the future thinking um, issue, um, one of the ways in which the QCTO is approaching this at the moment is um, we're using the ERRSS, that's the Economic Reconstruction and Recovery Skills Strategy, as a lens because there's 103, I think, occupations identified in that and some of them are current and some of them are like um, not too far in the future so um, le let me just take this example of uh, the whole issue of um, data and anal uh, analytics and big data and all of that suddenly just came up um, and so the QCTO has already together with uh, Mixita uh, developed 17 uh, programs to address that issue. So one of our methodologies now going forward is that we need a closer relationship with the CETA as the QCTO responsible for developing the qualifications because the CETAs have a closer, a closer alignment with the actual industry. And so we're looking at that as the feeding line. But I think there are other, other, other ways of, of doing it. And um, um, Ms. Voss was with me. We were in the Eastern Cape at the Nelson uh, or Tambo uh, district. And um, one would be surprised that um, the thing that was put forward as one of, um, and it may not be future, it was also way in the past, is cannabis. Um, that's the area where cannabis is actually cultivated, uh, or is the easiest place to cultivate cannabis. 
So while it may have been happening in a different context previously, mm -hmm. uh, right now they have, they have presented to us uh, actual um, model of um, what kind of industries it can, it can lead to. So when you look at that, then you've got to look at, okay, what are the occupations related to this thing in terms of this whole value chain? What's the byproducts? What? So I think, you know, it's, it's systems like that that we've got to be, be using. Unfortunately, it's not coordinated at the moment. It's like somebody hearing something and then you bring it on board and try to, to get it going. So we need, I, I think we need some, some more coordination and we're hoping that QCTO through the CETAs and the industry will be able to pick that up. And then the issue around the N1 to N3 um, is, uh, and I'm not talking on behalf of, 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 of Umalusi here at all, um, the N1 to N3, yes, was moved, was moved back to Umalusi. Um, it's still there. Um, if, if you're asking me from the QCTO, I would tell you now that if it's phased out tomorrow, we would have no problem with that. We've mm -hmm. developed occupational qualifications years ago that take care of all of these qualifications from N1 to N3. All your trades are covered by occupational qualifications. It is just a very, it's a pity. Uh, in fact, I don't know if pity is the right word to use. The department has only seen fit to fund N1 to N3 and the NCV programs and not to fund the occupational programs. So we have modernized occupational qualifications sitting on the framework, over 600 of them on the OFO, waiting to be taken up. Yes, the NSF has given funding now, <laughs> 2.2 billion <laughs> rand, let me just say that. But again, when I said department, you know what I meant. Uh, so the NSF has come, come and given the colleges 2.2 billion, no, what's it? Yeah, so about 2.2 billion rand for the uptake of occupational qualifications. So we believe there is some uh, uptake um, in terms of that. And when I talk about those occupational qualifications, they go all the way up to level eight. Um, so I, I, that's that's my take on it. But I also know that um, there was a, a document released, I think, just a few days ago, um, that is talking about that one N1 to N3 might be postponed slightly and that will be because of the dynamics at, at, the, at the college level, which I will not delve into. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I wanted to just very quickly respond to Jocelyn and Ken. I think mm. uh, there's maybe just some more to be said. Um, to, to Jocelyn, um, really, I mean, this, this issue of massified schooling and how we expect to create genius, genii, the Nazi, the grammar, <laughs> the grammar Nazi is going to get me now. But how we expect to create uh, kids who can take our entire economy and globe forward whilst trying to put them into a cookie cut cutter system, I think you know doesn't need to be further explained here. Um, but what we tend to do in, or, or what tends to happen in in South Africa, and I was having an interesting conversation over lunch, is that we find that people, uh, the same people, are accessing the same opportunities all the time, and so what we're finding is, firstly, those people are perhaps repeating. Uh, levels because uh, they're looking for that funding opportunity because of the need that is sitting there, uh, but also that you know, whole communities don't have the right information. Um, people don't have the right information. Families don't, and communities don't to actually guide students, kids, older people through the system. And what we find then is that people are taking opportunities, um, and it might even be. And I've said it often. You know, you can have a PhD, but if you need to go weld you're not going to start at NQ of 10. You know, you've got to go down and do the basics in order to get back to a level of competence for welding. Um, and so jumping around the NQF levels is not an issue for me unless it's done haphazardly without any uh, end goal and without agency and knowing what you're doing in that zigzag. Um, so, so, you know, I think advocacy, information and empowering communities is something that we all need to do. Um, and, you know, m many of us, are, our parents, uh, we're still not adequately equipped to even uh, to help our families through the system. And then to Ken, um, I come from a CETA, and I think that the CETAs have actually done some very good work and are continuing to do good work um, in what they can. Um, and of course, like, I guess, the NQF, I think the CETAs have also been asked to do everything. 
uh, all at once. And when one looks at the mandates of CETAs, particularly in their sectors, you find that it's, it might seem very logical. Oh, but you can see that there's a problem, do something. But you'll find, you know, the insurance CETA saying, well, I can't do that because that's in the finance CETA space. And we've got all these mandates that really, I guess, stop collaboration and hinder da real data analysis. And that's where the department and coordination needs to come in. Um, and, and I guess that's something that we are still having to grapple with to do better. Um, but I do know, and it's been a while now since I'm out of the system, but I know that initiatives through the DET and, and these partnerships are creating some, tra some traction with the CETAs. Um, so for instance, you're suddenly seeing CETAs with research departments. They've not had those before. Um, and so, you know, I for one am hopefully looking at the sector, at the CETA sector, and hoping that over the next few years we'll start to find, you know, um, the, that real specialist knowledge coming from those spaces. Um, but I think there is a need to incubate it for a little while yet. Okay, thank you. There's no, nothing, nothing for me, nothing. I'm <laughs> right, joking, right. I'm joking. <laughs> I do have one or two I want to respond to. I was just joking. I just <laughs> wanted to say... <laughs> You are so excited. <laughs> Sorry to disappoint. So, you know, the question about forecasting of skills in the future is a very critical one because, you know, how do you deal with short-term planning when you don't have the tools for the future forecasting? We can go back into the discussion about how useful is the OFO in that case. And the answer is it can't because it's mapping what exists is not really looking at what is in the future. But what I have found in the past few years is that we keep on talking about innovation. So the relationship between education, skills, and innovation systems are very critical. Um, and there's a, a huge amount of research work around that. For example, the hydrogen economy is something I'm hearing constantly. And there's a huge amount of research on it, but whether it gets absorbed or identified as part of the skills planning processes, it's about that methodology. But it's very important. I know the NSF did have a research project in conjunction with the department on that forecasting. And to be frank, no one in the world, we've done studies with other countries, no one has cracked this area about forecasting. Mm -hmm. And the reality is COVID just proved a point to us. You can forecast for the next 30 years, but you don't know what pandemics arise, where the technology changes, and innovation is a daily aspect in industry. Uh, but what we as the NSF have found is, when we look at the proposals around funding, we want to understand what is the research, what is innovative about what you're saying, because the NSF looks nationally. So it's not about duplicating what a sector would do. It's about much broader than that. And how do they sustain and exit beyond that? So those are some of the critical areas for research and sustainability on those forecasting initiatives. Then the, the point on CETA data, I know Mr. Lunka is here, we have a long history around work with the CETAs on data. And I know when we started in the department, there was very little data. But the challenge is, and while there is good work around research initiatives, partnerships with institutions like universities being in place now, similarly to the OFO, Everyone wants data, but the WSPATR is an instrument that was developed out of social partner impact. It's for a purpose, but now we want, it's almost like we want data paralysis because we want to understand something the employer must tell us. Mm. We need more data, and I think as researchers, we'd love it. We want more data so we get more insights, but the reality is, the data that CETAs are collected is for a purpose. Where it needs to be improved, that is always a process that needs to be undertaken. But bear in mind, those data instruments are not instruments of the department. They're part of social engagement with employers and union. So, the, but I think the key issue that, Ken, you are also trying to raise is we have data, but who has access to that data? 
and how clean is that data, which I think is another space in itself. And there are currently many proposals on clouds, the PSET cloud. There's also the CETAs collaborating. So I think there's a number of initiatives and one must be chosen based on uh, what, what will be used for. But what I want to say lastly, uh, program director, is uh, I would have loved to have an employer sitting next to me as we have this discussion because we have theorized about labor markets and about employers, but we do it often in absence of them in the discussion. Thanks. Thanks, Melissa. Good point. For our next, for our 20 year anniversary. <laughs> because I don't, I don't think we'll be doing this soon. Uh, so there, thank you, everyone. That was, I think, I'm sure, and maybe I should ask all of you to give these four brave people a hand. I think it's, it's, it's a brave, it's very brave to come and sit in front of a group like this, who they know are researching and thinking critically around skills issues as bureaucrats within the skills system and open themselves up to listen and to take the questions. We had many other questions and we're hope, we're hoping that we can take some of these forward with you as well as with all of you in the audience. Questions like uh, the role of smaller micro credentials and there seems to be in some policy quarters a lot of interest in them. We in the NQF at one time we tried to solve the problem with unit standards. Now there's a lot of debate about these stackable qualifications and part, part qualifications and short qualifications and whether micro credentials enables or hinders social justice. There's a lot of, ju of uh, discussion going on around issues like that. We've, ha we've also spoken a lot about the occupations in high demand list, uh, Mampo. Uh, and I think that one of the things we'd like to think a little bit more about, not just with Diet, but with everybody else, and then the experiences is, what are the challenges in using a list like the occupations in high demand list for direct provision planning and for resource allocation. Okay, how, how can we think more critically of what we should be using it for and what we shouldn't? And there are multiple other questions linked to these. And I'm sure they, that all of you are probably also going away. I think that what came very clearly is from where we started here. It's a complex issue <laughs> and it's difficult to get right. But I think that from the questions as well as from the responses and the people in the room, there are lots of things that are starting to come together. There are lots of little bits that are pe people are making connections. And I'm not only meaning these four, I'm talking about many of you in the room. There's a lot more attention now into how the pieces are coming together and how the picture, the macro pictures are actually starting to form about what is working and what is not working, and that's extremely important. Um, and when we fully understand why something is not working, it actually helps tremendously, because it gives us the first step in trying to put something in place to actually work. So even if you feel, oh, there are so many problems, but understanding those problems, being able to articulate them, describe them, understanding the mechanisms involved in those problems helps us to clarify where to take the next steps and how to work forward. So I'd like to thank again all four of you. Thank you for your time, thank you for your ex expertise, input, and your very honest responses to the, the multiple questions that were thrown at you. Thank you so much.